final best part of the evening for me is introducing my colleague, John Benjamin, who is probably my favorite naturalist at the Harris Center. Don't tell the other naturalists that, John. Um, he is not just an amazing um, mushroom person, but amphibians and reptiles and um, plants and birds and butterflies, you name it. John's just really an incredibly curious naturalist, always looking around, paying attention, super talented artist. If you get our hearsay, he often does our cartoons in our newsletter, which are so funny and beautifully done. And in his spare time, he's an amazing musician. And it's just my pleasure to have the opportunity to um, introduce John Benjamin this evening. So John, take it away. All right, thanks so much, Susie, and welcome everyone. I'm so happy you've all joined us this evening for this talk on the winter fungi of New Hampshire. Uh, Susie said to just maybe give you a little background story of how I got into fungus, because it wasn't always a, a subject that I was really very aware of. I grew up in Colorado, a much drier climate, and really wasn't tuned into the world of fungus until I moved out to New England uh, and started getting into uh, work as a naturalist out here and had some friends and mentors that were just so knowledgeable and just kind of tuned me in to start paying attention to uh, the world of mushrooms and fungi that, you know, were just growing all around and uh, just so fascinating and mysterious and colorful and bizarre and it became a wormhole for me. So I'm hoping maybe for some of you tonight, this could also be a little spark or initiation and to just start to look around, pay attention, and just realize what a wonderful world we have right outside our doors, in our backyards, or in local forests. Uh, the world of fungus is really all around us. And that's kind of the theme of tonight, is that fungus is everywhere, even in winter, even in the season that we don't consider to be the, the height of you know fungus diversity. There's a lot of amazing things to be found, and that's what I'm hoping to share with you all tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. So, fungi diversity in New Hampshire, the mushrooms of winter is our theme tonight. So we are really going to be focusing on the types of mushrooms that you can see this time of year when you're out hiking in the woods, even when there's snow on the ground, freezing temperatures, there is still a lot of diversity to be found. And it's honestly kind of a helpful uh, way to limit our focus tonight, because I mean, if you open the window to all the mushrooms you can find throughout the year, that would require many more hours of lecturing, which we don't have tonight. So we're going to see how many examples of winter species of mushrooms we can fit in tonight. I'll try my best to keep things moving so we don't run out of time, but also make sure that uh, we're, we're given credit to all these different species and we give enough information to uh, allow us all to follow along. So let's dive right in. And let's see here. All right, so a very quick little bit of background just for some people that might be brand new to fungus, maybe just uh, ha don't have a lot of understanding of really what these organisms are. Uh, we're gonna kind of do a little bit of introduction and then we'll dive into these different species that you can find in the wintertime here in New Hampshire. So what are fungi? By the way, you can say fungi or fungi. Either way is correct. I've tried to gravitate towards fungi because some of my favorite mycologists say that, but either one is fine. Uh, so this is a unique kingdom of life, which means it is totally unique from other kingdoms like plants and animals. And uh, that is not something that Scientists even had a good understanding of until the 1960s, believe it or not. It used to be considered to be kind of a weird branch of the, the plant kingdom. But after more investigation and, you know, more scientists started really looking into it, they recognized there were some very fundamental differences between uh, fungi and the other kingdoms. So very uh, fundamental is that fungi do not use photosynthesis like plants. They cannot use sunlight to make their own uh, carbohydrates and food. So... That is not within their skill set. We'll talk about lichens at the end, which is a little bit of a gray area with symbiosis, but we'll we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so fungus, like animals, they must consume organic substances in their environment. So they have to find things to eat in the environment, just like we do. But unlike us, fungus has no internal digestive system. They have to digest things on the outside. And we'll talk about the basic fungal anatomy here in a moment about how they're able to do that. But really, in a nutshell, some 
basic differences that uh, describe the uniqueness of the fungi kingdom. And uh, uh, genetic uh, evidence has really shown it's more related to animals than to plants when you look at an evolutionary history standpoint. So you are more closely related to a mushroom than to an oak tree, which is kind of interesting, I think. All right, so let's talk about the basic anatomy of fungus. Some of you might be familiar with some of these terms. I'm going to try to introduce some vocabulary we'll be, we'll be coming back to, and this is just such a, a fundamental part of understanding what uh, fungi really is. So the main structures of the growth of fungi are not the mushrooms that you see, but they are these branching threads of hyphae, these little filaments you can see there in the microscopic photo. Uh, there's often just one cell thick, just these very, very thin little branching networks that form this interconnected web called mycelium which you can see below, and I'm sure some of you have probably seen mycelium. You go out in the woods, you look under some logs and old pieces of bark, and you will be able to find mycelium. And this is the main body, the main structure of fungus. This is where all the action is going on. So it's releasing enzymes to break down and absorb nutrients from whatever substrate it's growing in. And this is really why we consider fungus to be the super digesters of nature. They can break down and absorb all kinds of things that other organisms can't. And we'll talk about that quite a bit more tonight with different examples of some of these uh, species we'll be getting into. And, uh, you know, most mycelium is hidden. We don't notice it unless you're really looking and paying attention in the woods. But it's incredibly abundant really all around us, especially in the soil and in dead organic materials. So all the dead logs and dead trees and dead anything that's outside in the environment, there is most likely going to be mycelium uh, growing in there and taking advantage of the nutrients and also, as we'll talk about, helping to break down these different things as well as some other uh, incredible ecological roles that it's playing. Uh, so mushrooms are what we're going to be focusing on tonight because that's what we can see when we're out hiking. That's really the evidence of these different species that are recognizable. But it's important to recognize uh, what mushrooms are. So they're the fruiting bodies of fungus, uh, which is uh, the more scientific term for these reproductive structures that grow from the mycelium for one purpose, to release spores into the environment. Every single mushroom you see, that's the main job that it has. So mushrooms are ephemeral structures, temporary structures for reproduction and dispersal, despite their incredible diversity of colors and you know forms and all the bizarre things you see, this is the purpose of all these mushrooms. And you can see on the right there, some of these puffball mushrooms growing from the mycelium on this piece of wood. So you need to have mycelium in place first before you're gonna have mushrooms sprouting out for this purpose of disseminating microscopic spores, which are floating in the air all around us, can just move in the, the wind and the water, find new substrates and new habitats to colonize, begin growing into new hyphae, new mycelium. And that is the way that fungus can move uh, to new places, even around the world, to uh, other continents, you know. So some of these species we're talking about tonight, they can be found in Europe and Asia and Russia, all kinds of similar temperate habitats around the world because of this dispersal uh, mechanism with spores. So here's a couple photos of mushrooms releasing spores. I'm sure some of you have observed puffballs before. We'll hopefully have time to talk about uh, puffballs briefly, where you can actually poke them and see the spores. Most mushrooms, you can't actually observe it because it's coming out at a more uh, gradual rate. But every mushroom, if it's active and alive, is releasing uh, often millions of spores into the environment. And we're going to be talking a little bit about some uh, categories of fungus tonight, and we'll be referring to some vocabulary words that will be helpful to kind of get briefed on right now. But there's kind of three basic categories of fungi based on how they get energy, what they eat. And the category we're really going to focus on tonight is the, the group that we call the saprophytes, saprophytic fungi. Saprobic is another word that you sometimes will hear. It means the same thing. And these fungi consume dead organic material. It's all the dead stuff in the woods, especially plant material and dead trees and wood. These are the fungi that get their energy from eating all this stuff. And this is an incredibly important ecological role in every forest or really terrestrial environment uh, on the planet because of their role in decomposition and nutrient cycling, breaking down all this dead stuff much faster than any other organism and getting those nutrients back into the soil so they can be reutilized by plants and really a fundamentally necessary part of any terrestrial ecosystem and certainly any forest like the ones we have in New Hampshire. 
and fungi are the only living things that can break down some of these basic components of wood, like cellulose and lignin. And we'll talk a little bit about those more in a moment here. But a lot, pretty much all, in fact, of the mushrooms we're talking about tonight, these winter mushrooms, are these saprophytes, ones that will be found growing uh, mostly from dead wood and dead material in the environment. But there are other types of uh, fungi. Some are parasites or pathogens, and these ones actually consume the tissues of living hosts. Uh, the hosts could be other plants, or uh, sorry, just plants or trees, animals, or other fungi. Sometimes you can see mushrooms growing from living trees, and that's a pretty good piece of evidence that you have a parasitic fungus there. And there are also an incredibly important group of fungi called the mycorrhizal fungi. And we're not going to get into this too much tonight. Maybe we can have a whole nother lecture about these another time. But these are fungi that form a partnership or a mutualism with trees and plants through the roots in the soil. So basically, they're helping each other out. The trees actually feed the fungus in this case, and the fungus helps the trees and plants to absorb more nutrients and water. It's such a huge part of the health and resilience of forest ecosystems. There's a lot of new research about this, even ways trees can communicate and feed each other. I could go on about this for a long time, but we got to keep moving tonight. So uh, we'll talk about mycorrhizae maybe in a future uh, lesson a bit more. But tonight we're going to really focus especially on these saprophytes for the winter fungi. And here's a good example of what it looks like when you have saprophytic fungi in the environment. Some of you may have seen this before, this brown rot evidence where dead wood starts to break into these kind of cubical, dry, brittle pieces. And this is example, uh, an example of fungi that breaks down the cellulose in dead wood, which forms the cell walls of all plants. And what's left over is, you know, the lignin and other materials, which are dry and brittle. Uh, with kids, I call this uh, sometimes Lego wood, you know, it breaks off in these little bricks. And this is just evidence of the brown rot fungi in action. There's many, many species that do this. We'll be talking about quite a few tonight. So just a cool piece of evidence to be looking for out in the woods any time of year that shows this decomposition in action from these saprophytes. And another big category of saprophytes are the white rot fungi that leave behind this white stringy material. So this group of fungi decompose the lignin in the dead wood. And again, no other organisms on Earth can do this uh, effectively. And what's left behind is this spongy, kind of just squishy stuff with kids I call it tuna fish wood sometimes to remember what it kind of looks and feels like. Uh, and another just really you know easy to observe piece of evidence of the decomposition happening all around us in the forest. Let's talk a little bit about what fungi are doing in the winter time, that sort of survival and kind of, you know, what's happening this time of year. Um, and really, most mycelium becomes dormant when the conditions are too cold and too dry. It's just a matter of chemistry and phys physics. You can't have metabolism. You can't have chemical reactions when the conditions get too cold and dry. So like a, any other organism that needs to survive and go into a dormant phase in uh, wintertime here in New Hampshire, they have some mechanisms and evolutionary strategies to not get too damaged during this time of year. Uh, when they're not active and there's ice and all these tough conditions around. So um, like a lot of other organisms, they do have some very cool ways of preventing damage. They have certain carbohydrates and proteins they produce that can basically lower the freezing temperature of cells, which is called super cooling. And uh, quite a number of other organisms do this. We found it in plants and vertebrates and invertebrates. They first discovered it, I think, in, you know, um, uh, Arctic fish, I believe. Uh, but these are some basic strategies to sort of, uh, you know, reduce the freezing temperature and, uh, you know, not have the ice crystals form at the same temperature they would otherwise. And another strategy is they concentrate these sugar alcohols like glucose in the cells. And that basically reduces cell damage from the crystallization of ice. When you know ice crystals form in a cell, it expands, it breaks cell membranes, it destroys the organelles. And you know most organisms get pretty uh, destroyed when they are frozen and also you know dried out. But these, these strategies of using these um, sugar alcohols really does prevent them from having as much damage. So the mycelium that's continued continues to be, you know, all around us in the winter. For the most part, it's dormant. But you have to wonder about, you know, the the soil layers that are under the snow. Some of you might know about how there's a subnivian zone under the snow where, you know, mammals can be active. And you can probably have conditions where the mycelium can be doing its thing and continuing to grow just fine, uh, not needing to go into this dormant phase. Uh, but certainly a lot of fungus does need to, to employ these mechanisms to survive when conditions get cold in the winter. 
And uh, like I mentioned, most of the mushrooms that you can find in winter that we're going to be talking about are the saprophytic species because really, you know, they they still have uh, stuff to eat in the winter. And some of them are, are pretty tough and, uh, you know, able to persist. But the, uh, you know, the parasitic species, well, you know, trees aren't being active right now. They don't have an active source of nutrients as much. And the mycorrhizal species, you know, trees are not transporting those sugars down into their roots. So we're really focusing on the saprophytes tonight. And uh, a lot of mushrooms we're talking about tonight are ones that persist into the winter, even though they're not actively releasing spores anymore. So they're just tougher mushrooms. They've already gone through their cycle of releasing the spores, and they're just kind of still in the environment, and they take a while before they decompose. So that's something that's pretty commonly seen with some of these species in the wintertime. Um, but certainly there are species that opportunistically become active and produce mushrooms during warm spells in the winter. Uh, so, I mean, it's interesting to think about as climate change makes our winter conditions more erratic and we have more of these warm spells, some mushrooms and some, some fungi can take advantage of that. And you'll see them becoming active during these warmer, wetter phases. So we'll talk about some species that do that tonight as well. So let's dive into some species and some families of fungi that we can find in the winter. And this is a really important, uh, pretty easy to find group of fungi uh, in winter. We call them the polypores, also known as brackets or shelf mushrooms. And in general, these are pretty tough mushrooms. They have a pretty uh, you know, thick and wood-like consistency. They can grow for months or sometimes years. You know, Most of these soft-bodied mushrooms that we see in summer or fall, they'll grow for a few weeks. They send out spores and they just break down. They get eaten by things and they turn into mush and their, their purpose is, is fulfilled. But these polypores, they can keep growing year after year, sometimes even for decades with some of these extremely large polypores you can occasionally see in uh, some older growth forests. Um, and they're called polypores because they have these tiny holes on the bottom of the mushroom, which are called pores. So polypore means many pores. And uh, that is where all of the spores are being released. I always have my students say, uh, pores make spores. You can say that 10 times fast to help you remember and not get confused. <laughs> and uh, most polypores are very important decomposers or saprophytes of dead wood. So we'll be talking about a number of different polypores tonight. Here's one of my favorite and my favorite polypores, an easy one to identify. It's called the birch polypore. And as the name suggests, they are mostly, in fact, almost exclusively found on birch trees, dead birch wood. They have this very cool texture, kind of rubbery and corky when they're still fresh, uh, a pretty unique uh, a feel to it. Um, and they're a brown rot saprophyte like we talked about. And they kind of have this uh, uh, little stem that attaches to the tree. So they kind of become sort of uh, thin where they actually are branching out from the wood. And this is an example of a medicinal mushroom that has been used by humans for a long, long time, as we'll talk about in a moment. It's been shown to have various medicinal properties, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antiviral, anti-tumor properties. A number of these polypores that we have growing around us do have these different medicinal values. And we'll talk about some other species that have these values as well. Uh, but birch polypores are just great ones when you're trying to get into starting to recognize some of these species because they're just so unique and the fact that they're only found on birch trees just gives a really kind of easy way to start tuning in to where they are in the environment and the sort of the uniqueness of this species. Uh, so that's a great one to be looking out for in the woods even in winter time. Another very uh, common and very uh, unique polypore in winter is called the tindraconk and this species is really kind of a regular kind of hoof-shaped very tough and woody. Often it's, it's, it's very, uh, you know, vertically oriented. They can be pretty sort of tall looking compared to other mushrooms. Uh, they have a range of colors from light gray to beige to very dark colors, brown and black. And eventually they start to break down and you'll see crumbling old black tinder conks sometimes. They grow from all kinds of different dead deciduous trees and logs. This species also has a pretty cool history of use from humans. Uh, it gets its name because it's very flammable when you uh, use the internal material of these mushrooms. So it's been used as a fire starter for a long time and even as an, uh, a transporter of embers. You can actually carry the smoldering embers of a fire from one place to another. And in the olden times when we didn't have lighters and easy, easy fire starting tools, this was an incredibly valuable way to get your fire going quickly at a new campground if humans were going in, uh, around in cold climates. 
Uh, some friends of mine uh, tried this, uh, and I we tried this once. We you know put the internal material of a tinder conch on fire. It smoldered for two days, and then our boss made it, us put it out because he was worried we were going to set the uh, cabin on fire where we were working. So could have gone longer potentially, but uh, a pretty cool use that this mushroom has had. It can also be mashed into a pulp and turned into a fabric, which is called amadou. Uh, there's a, a really famous and amazing. Um, uh, you know, mycological researcher named Paul Stamets. You can find his TED Talks online, which are awesome. And he always wears his Amadou hat when he goes and does these talks. And uh, also has a lot of medicinal uses, like the birch polypore. So a very cool thing that some of you might be aware of. Well, here's uh, some other examples of tinder conchs. You can see variation in color and, you know, this very regular lumpy sort of appearance to them. Uh, and here we have a picture, the last known photograph, of Oatsy the Iceman. Just kidding, it's a recreation based on his preserved body they found in the Alps, uh, buried in a glacier. He died about 5,200 years ago, they think, and they found in his satchel pieces of both birch polyport and tinder conch, which gives evidence of the ancient relationship that humans have had with these species that we still have around us today. They really think that he probably medicinally uh, might have been using tinder conch to start fires, but he had an injury. He was probably using uh, the birch polypore as a way to treat the uh, inflammation or infection of his wound. You could even use it topically to help, you know, uh, reduce the bacterial infections of, of wounds. So, you know, we have a long-standing relationship with these species, and many people do still use these for uh, medicinal value, for fire starting, and it's just cool that we still have this mushroom all around us today. Another kind of famous and common polypore, the artist conch, one that has this kind of nice smooth brown, um, you know, a top to it and a very uh, a white smooth pore surface on the bottom. It produces tons of spores, which are cinnamon colored. You can often see them kind of dusting the wood or on other mushrooms beneath it. Uh, and another decomposer species. Also, I should mention some of these species are considered to be semi-parasitic, which means they're usually breaking down deadwood, but if they have a chance to get into the heartwood of a living tree, they're going to take that opportunity. So it's not always black and white if they're fully saprophytic or even somewhat parasitic. In nature, things get to be pretty fuzzy sometimes. So some of these species will get into the heartwood of damaged living trees and hasten their demise by growing into and, and decomposing the heartwood. Uh, but the name artist conch comes from the way people use them to actually make artwork. So, you know, they can become very large, they, they're, they have these nice smooth surfaces underneath, and if you just have a twig or just some sort of implement, you can actually etch into the spore surface and leave these uh, patterns or artwork underneath. And if, then if you break it off and let it dry, that will set. Uh, in the past, I've had students, if you don't break it off, you can right into it and then it will just continue to grow and cover up the old the old writing so we've called it the uh you know, nature's graffiti board in the past you can you know sketch on it and it'll just grow over over time and you can you know see the the names and etchings of people in the past but one to be looking out for in the woods they can become quite large as well i've seen some artist conks that are platter sized pretty impressive Another very distinctive polypore is one we call the red belted polypore, and you can see how it gets its name. It just has this very distinctive reddish orange little band around the margin. Uh, when they get old, they start to lose that bright color, and that's an important thing to mention. Many mushrooms, as they get old, they lose their distinctive colors and some of those identifying features, so old mushrooms can be tricky sometimes as they start to fade and break down. But when you have a living, uh, fresh, red-belted polypore, it's very uh, easy to identify. Another very important decomposer, one that uh, will only grow from conifer wood in this case. A little uh, vocab word to use, too, is zonate, which means mushrooms that have kind of this concentric uh, grooved appearance on the top of the mushroom or, or striping pattern. We'll have some other mushrooms we'll talk about tonight that are zonate. But here's another example of the red belted polypore. This is one, another one. It's, it's great to have some mushrooms that are just so distinctive that you see them and you just know what they are right away. There's no mistake in them. And that would include the cinnabar polypore. And the color of these is just wonderful and just so eye-catching, especially when you're out in winter or, you know, I, I find these all the time in a logging sites. There's lots of dead wood lying around, you know, kind of these gray drab landscapes. But you find these bright red-orange polypores sprouting out of the dead wood. Uh, look underneath them and just the color of the pore surface is just so uh, vibrant and unmistakable. 
an example of a white rot fungus on a dead hardwood. Good one to be looking out for and just an easy one to identify. Now, this photo here was sent to me by a student in one of my, my classes in the past, and I love this photo because it gives an example of, I think, probably our most common mushroom that you can find in the woods any time of year in New Hampshire, in New England. It's incredibly abundant, but it's often pretty tricky to identify because people often see these old specimens like you see here. So it's they're, they're tattered, there's algae growing on them, they've kind of faded to white. Uh, there's really not a lot of you know distinctive features at this point, uh, but this is the same species when it's fresher. Uh, you can see it persisting in the winter here. And this is a great one to have some knowledge about to be looking out for because it's just so common. And this is called the violet tooth polypore. So when these mushrooms are young and still active, you will generally see a beautiful kind of purplish color, especially underneath the underside of the mushroom. And I should mention, anytime you're trying to identify a mushroom, you always look underneath the cap, so the bottom side of the mushroom, and looking for the structures there. We've talked about pores for polypores, the little holes. And in this case, for this species, they have what are called teeth. So it is a polypore, but the polypore, uh, I'm sorry, the pore surface starts to look kind of bristly underneath, like these little sort of spiky structures, which are called teeth. And this is the most distinctive feature of the species that will persist even when the colors fade. So whenever you're seeing these kinds of uh, small shelf-like mushrooms growing from dead trees and dead wood, always look underneath the cap to see what kind of texture or features are underneath. And that can be such an important part of identifying species. Uh, this one also has the zonate striping on the top, very densely clustered often. Uh, when you see the fresh ones, the purple color is just such a, a beautiful uh, you know, giveaway for the species, but they, they will fade in color, like I mentioned. They grow on all kinds of dead hardwood, very common to see on old snags in the forest, often just you know coating the, the sides of these trunks, just these, these small uh, little fruiting bodies up and down, and just an incredibly common mushroom to find. Here are some different photos that show just examples of the variations of appearance of it. So always look for those bristly teeth underneath, even if the colors have faded. And sometimes they become quite green with that algae that can grow on the top of them. Uh, but when they're fresh, they have some beautiful purplish coloration that's always cool to see when you can find some younger specimens. So be always on the lookout for violet tooth polypores. Let's talk about a more famous polypore, and this is one that often people will uh, assume a mushroom is without looking carefully. So here we have the turkey tail mushroom, which is one that a lot of people might have heard about. It has a catchy name based on the similarity to the patterns on the tail feathers of turkeys. Uh, but there are a number of lookalikes, including the violet tooth polypore we've already talked about. So true turkey tails, as I sometimes say, they, you know, they're like the other one we talked about, violet tooth, they're overlapping, densely clustered shelving fruiting bodies. They're thin, tough, kind of velvety textured on the top. They have that zonate striping. They can have a wide range of coloration, hence the, the species name versicolor, which means just lots of different color patterns and variability that you can find depending on where it's growing and what the local conditions are. Uh, you can find these on you know, logs and stumps, dead hardwood, very commonly in the forest all through the year. And these are another uh, species of mushroom that has been shown to have some very uh, uh, you know, wonderful medicinal value and potential. So it's being studied, especially for its anti-carcinogenic or cancer-fighting properties. And you can already buy these uh, you know, online or at you know, um, health food stores for these immune-boosting properties. But uh, it's one that really has a lot of potential for this medicinal value. And always look underneath to see what you have. And in this case, for a true turkey tail, you have this creamy, white, smooth pore surface with these very tiny little round pores there. And that's very unique, very different than a lot of the lookalikes. So that's really the, the, the key you want to be looking for when you're trying to identify a true turkey tail. Here are some other examples of true turkey tails, lots of different colors. And you can see that densely clustered growth form it has. And just a really beautiful mushroom, always always fun to find. And once you start to tune in to recognize that it's a great one to be able to add to your repertoire. Uh, one of the lookalikes is called False Turkey Tail. Good name. So it looks pretty similar on the top, 
but underneath it doesn't have that smooth white pore surface. It kind of looks pretty similar to the to the top surface. So it kind of has this more thin kind of papery texture and has sort of striping underneath similar to the top. So that's the way you'd really be able to differentiate it from turkey tail or other look-alike species. But also a very beautiful mushroom can also have some really uh, gorgeous colors and variations that zonate striping like we talked about already. Uh, this is one that you'll find very commonly. This is a, a sort of a smaller, more tattered looking polypore as I describe it. It's usually pretty orange in color, uh, much smaller fruiting bodies, and very papery, hence the name crowded parchment. And uh, you know, you'll find this a lot of times on you know uh, pieces of uh, branches and sticks that have maybe fallen from the, the canopy in a storm or something, or just lying on the ground, and just that really sort of tattered, densely clustered papery appearance can give away the crowded parchment fungus, uh, but also can have some really beautiful uh, patterns and colors when you look carefully at it. So one to give a little closer look to when you find it uh, in a very, very common mushroom you'll find all through the year. This is a fun one that you can find sometimes, and the, the, the nickname mozzarella cheese polypore is one that my students and I have given this one. You won't find this in any field guide, but I think it's a helpful way to remember it. I always encourage people to come up with their own nicknames for species if it helps you remember it because, hey, you know, it's just a way to recognize these species when you're out there. And uh, in this case, when it's not too cold, this sort of white uh, polypore has a very pliant, squishy, cheese-like texture. It kind of looks and feels like mozzarella cheese. When it's cold, it'll become frozen, like a cheese popsicle or something. Uh, but uh, it's one that you can find very commonly, another very common decomposer. And not edible, doesn't taste like cheese, but it's a fun one to give a little squeeze to when you see it in warm conditions. Now here's one that I saw some people mention in the chat at the beginning. It's a pretty famous and sought after medicinal mushroom and a pretty weird one too. It's called the chaga, also called the clinker conch sometimes. And the uh, what you'll, you'll see are these black charcoal like masses growing from birch trees. And these actually aren't mushrooms, but it's actually a mass of condensed mycelium called sclerotia, which is just a strange growth form for, for a, a fungus and a mushroom. And uh, these are parasites actually of birch trees. So this is one example of a parasite that you can find in the winter. And they will you know, get into damaged birch trees, hasten the, the rot of the heartwood. And uh, you can find them throughout the year and, you know, cutting these, these cankers off, these, uh, these sclerotia masses, uh, is where the medicinal value lies. And, you know, if you're collecting these, you, you don't want to get old, decayed ones. You want to find ones where when you cut into them, they're kind of nice and kind of orange looking and woody inside. But it's often tough to remove these things. This is one that I, I love collecting. It can be used to make teas and tinctures and has just a lot of immunity boosting properties. Another mushroom that's been used you know, around the world for a long, long time for all of its antibacterial, antiviral properties with all these you know, different um, complex polysaccharides. You know, it's a, it's a big question why these mushrooms have all these incredible compounds inside, whether they're medicines or poisons, you know, why all this diversity, why all this complexity? If they're just these temporary, you know, uh, reproductive structures, that's a whole conversation we can get into maybe in another, another lesson you know, kind of gets into the, the deep evolutionary history of these uh, these species of fungi and perhaps even some of the symbiotic relationships with other species too, you know, because that's what fungus does again and again. It forms all these partnerships and has ways of interacting with other species in the environment. So we'll kind of maybe come back to these conversations again in a future class. Let's keep moving along here. This is a really fun one to find in the winter. It's just a really cool, beautiful looking winter mushroom called the crimped gill. And these ones are, are kind of more pliant and rubbery, very small, very densely clustered, but underneath them they have this very cool, bright white, sort of wrinkly gill-like appearance. We'll talk about gills here in a moment. Um, here's kind of a more zoomed in look at the crimped gill underneath this kind of wrinkly appearance. Uh, but they're just very striking, a very cool uh, decomposer mushroom. And sort of that rubbery texture and the, the, the bright white wrinkled appearance underneath is really the giveaway for this one. So a fun one to be looking out for. 
I, I should mention, it's always great to feel mushrooms. Some people have asked me before, hey, can you absorb poisons or toxins from a mushroom by touching it? The answer is no. You need to eat a mushroom to get poisoned by it. So it's always safe to, you know, touch it and, uh, you know, often even, even pick it up or pluck it. I mentioned how these are ephemeral reproductive structures. Uh, you're not killing the mycelium when you, when you pick off a little piece of mushroom to have a better look at it. So it's really not a big deal to do that if you want to be able to investigate it more closely. Now here is a true guild mushroom that you can sometimes find in winter. This is a, a pretty cool species called the velvet shank. And gills are these kind of co uh, concentric ridges you'll find, kind of like bicycle spokes on many, many species of mushrooms underneath the cap. So once again, always look underneath. Uh, this is one that will grow in these clusters, and they have this kind of dark uh, darkening of the lower stem of where it you know, connects to the dead wood where they're growing and a kind of a velvety texture. These are an edible species. Uh, people do eat them and look for them, but I gotta say any gilled mushroom that's kind of brown in appearance are nicknamed LBMs, little brown mushrooms. And you gotta always be super careful with LBMs because there are tons of lookalikes. You can get a, a poisonous mushroom by accident. So for any edible species I'm talking about tonight, please, please, please be very cautious and very careful. Uh, you never wanna consume any mushroom that you're not certain about. And you really gotta be careful with these brown gilled mushrooms like the velvet shank. But a few more photos of the velvet shank, often kind of uh, slimy or sticky on the top, especially in wet conditions. And you can really see that, that dark uh, coloration on the stalk in that other photo there. A very famous edible mushroom that many of you may have uh, known about or even eaten is the oyster mushroom. And this is kind of a cool fleshy gilled mushroom that uh, you can find kind of any time of year. If, if you have enough of a warm spell, this is, is quite variable in when it can grow. Uh, but you want to be looking for that clustering growth, that sort of white gray fleshy texture and the gills that are sort of growing, you know, uh, you know, laterally from where it's attached. And also they're called decurrent, which means that they sort of blend into the stem, as I'll show you in a minute. They are uh, a saprophyte, and oysters are known to break down kind of all kinds of things, like really any organic material. The mycelium can even break down the hydrocarbons in oil. So these are being used and continuously researched for their use to clean up pollution sites, which is called mycoremediation. And there's a lot of cool research about how fungus can be used to help break down some of these volatile pollutants that really nothing else can break down. And this very common edible species is one species that can do that. Here's some more oyster mushroom pictures there. You can see how the gills are pretty unique and how they have that decurrent sort of blending into the, uh, the stalk there, the clustering growth. This is, it's a pretty good edible to, if you're starting out to try to become tuned into. Once again, you want to be incredibly cautious, but some species are just easier to get familiar with. And I would say oysters are a friendlier edible species to get tuned into. Uh, another oyster species is called the late fall oyster. These ones tend to come out, you know, in late fall, early winter, as the name suggests. They're a bit tougher than the other more common oyster. They are still edible. You just got to cook them a bit longer. They have this kind of more um, sort of olive color on the cap and kind of an orange or yellow uh, color in the gills. And I, I see these persisting into winter. They'll, they'll you know, they're not good to eat anymore once they get all dried out and kind of broken down. But you will see these, uh, you know, throughout the winter persisting on dead trees, saprophyte of hardwoods. This is a pretty cool mushroom that you can find in the winter, and it's actually a, a, the same genus as the last one we talked about, but this one is called the luminescent pinellus, and it gets the name because this is a bioluminescent mushroom when it's fresh and actively growing, which means it glows in the dark, uh, which scientists think is a way to attract insects in the nighttime to come and walk on the gills, collect some spores, and probably disperse them into the environment. And uh, in the winter, these things become pretty shriveled. You know, they look similar to a lot of other species we've talked about. They kind of have this dense clustered look, but you look underneath for the, those gills that you can see and uh, very different than the other, you know, uh, species like the crowded parchment or the crimped gill that we've talked about. And, uh, you know, if you find these in the summertime when they're fresh, you can sometimes observe the bioluminescence. You can maybe take a few specimens home, you know, put them in a very dark room or closet and let your eyes adjust and you can see the bioluminescence, which is a pretty cool thing to observe. 
let's move into uh, one of my favorite groups of fungi, the jelly fungi family. I'm sure many of you have observed these. There's a lot of different species. This is probably the most common jelly fungus that I find uh, throughout the year, including the winter, the orange jelly fungus. And like the name suggests, these things are gelatinous. So they're kind of jelly-like, squishy. I always tell kids, you got to poke them. You got to gotta see what they feel like to really appreciate what these, these fruiting bodies are. And, you know, they, they're, they're pretty resilient. So uh, they expand when it's warm and wet. And when it's dry or too cold, they shrivel and you hardly notice them. But during warm spells in winter, it's very common to see them expand again and become these kind of gelatinous, almost translucent orange fruiting bodies. Uh, they're technically edible, but not exactly a choice edible. Pretty tasteless and kind of gross in my uh, limited experience eating these. Some people, you know, uh, swear by how they're great, but I'm not in that that party there. So maybe if you're trying to survive in the woods, it's not going to poison you, but not exactly a, a tasty edible here. Uh, here's a sort of more uh, larger growth there, kind of a lobey appearance when they're really absorbing water and expanding during these warm, wet spells. Another example of jelly fungus that is a bit more of a sought-after edible is called the wood ear. Pretty good uh, name for to describe the appearance of these larger fruiting bodies, kind of ear-like, more of like a purplish appearance. But again, jelly, jelly fungi, they really change uh, their appearance based on the uh, amount of moisture in the environment and the temperature. So look out for them on warm days when there's been moisture recently, so sometimes warm winter days. Here's a pretty cool, uh, a tiny, tiny mushroom you'll see very commonly, and I love the nickname, Lemon Discos. Uh, and you got to really look closely because these are little bitty fruiting bodies, these little uh, sort of bright yellow discs and dense clusters found on uh, dead deciduous wood that doesn't have bark anymore. You got to really look closely to, to appreciate uh, the beauty of this species, but just one that is a very, very common throughout the year. and. A good example of one you really got to be paying close attention to uh, to find when you're out hiking around. Now, some of you may have seen something like this at uh, different times of year, where you see this blue-green stain on a piece of dead wood. You know, for a long time, I didn't know what this was when I was first out in New England, but this is an example of a species of fungus that is called the blue stain fungus, or uh, maybe a more uh, uh, fun to remember name, the green elf cup. And basically, the mycelium has a blue-green pigment in it called xylandine, and that stains the wood this really cool, unique, bluish-green color. And every once in a while, you get lucky, and you see the tiny little blue fruiting bodies that appear. Very small, very uh, short-lived, but it's always a cool thing to actually see the, um, the little mushrooms appear from the, uh, the blue-stained fungus. But you'll see the wood all the time if the snow is melting, Look on the ground. It's a very common thing to see this little decomposer species. Now, here's one I mentioned earlier: uh, puffballs. And here's our. There's many kinds of puffballs I should mention, but the most common one you'll find is the pear-shaped puffball that forms these very dense clusters of uh, kind of marble-shaped, pear-shaped uh, uh, mushrooms, marble-sized, I should say. And uh, you know, their time is over as far as when they're active and actually releasing spores, but you can still sometimes find their old tattered remnants through the winter. Um, and when they're young, they are edible, when the inner flesh is still white and succulent, but they start to become mature, they turn yellow inside, no good to eat anymore, and eventually they release the spores. Uh, and you can you know, poke them and see these bursts of spores come out once they become mature, like you can see here in this little double uh, series of photos there. It's always fun to uh, actually observe spores in action because most species you can't actually see what they're doing but with puffballs you can when the time is right and here's what it might look like this time of year if you find old pear-shaped puffballs they're kind of tattered but they will still be you know persisting in the environment for for a while longer before they totally decompose all right moving right along i think we're doing enough uh, uh moving fast enough we can have some time for lichens so i'd be uh, remiss if i didn't include lichens in a talk about winter fungi Lichens are an incredible and very complex group of fungi that are not just fungi, uh, fungi, I should say. I go back and forth sometimes, fun fungi and fungi, but it's both correct, right? So fungi, uh, sorry, lichens are composite organisms. They are uh, uh, a mutualism, a symbiosis of a fungus and an internal photosynthesizing partner called an endophotosymbiont. So a little 
organism that can make energy and make sugars from sunlight. So that could be an algae or a cyanobacteria or sometimes multiple species of both of those things in some, uh, some lichens. You, you have yeasts in there too. Really lichens can be considered almost like an ecosystem more than one species. Or someone described it once as uh, mushrooms that discovered farming. They have a little internal farmer or a little chef inside that makes them their food right from sunlight. So lichens can be found everywhere because of this unique symbiosis. Any terrestrial ecosystem, even, you know, uh, Arctic rocks or deserts, if they have a place where they have a little bit of moisture and access to sunlight, you can find lichens. And uh, they are incredibly resilient. They can survive extended periods of dry or cold conditions by kind of going to this dormant phase called cryptobiosis. Sometimes scientists say if there's one species of Earth that could survive, maybe traveling on a you know meteorite to another planet, something like a lichen would probably be able to do it because of their incredible resilience to you know uh, lack of moisture, even radiation. Lichens are kind of super organisms, and is a testament to the power of this partnering of these different uh, components of lichen. And you'll often see these all the time around us on tree trunks and branches. People often, often ask me, hey, are these parasites? Are they hurting trees? They're really not because they don't need to absorb nutrients from the trees. They don't need to dig in like other species to get their energy. They just need kind of a perch to get their sunlight, get their, their moisture uh, just from the air, from rain. They will also absorb uh, nutrients uh, right from the the air from the atmosphere and then actually when it rains they will um, sort of exude you know some of those nutrients it'll trickle down and actually get into the roots of the trees so it actually can provide a benefit to the, the host trees the living trees that they're on by uh, you know sharing some of these nutrients they're getting from the air and you'll find lichens on living trees on dead trees on on rocks even on you know, old gravestones or sidewalks, they really are incredibly resilient and you know incredibly abundant organisms. When I go out with students, even in the winter, usually what I'll say is look around, you'll probably see a lichen before anything else if you just pay attention and tune in to some of the trees and rocks around you. So a very quick review of some very common lichen species. This is one I see all the time, common green shield. When you're driving around or going for a walk, just look at trees around you, you'll see this kind of sea green colored uh, leafy lichen that often forms these kind of uh, round patches and it's an example of what we call a folios lichen so these are types of lichens that tend to have this kind of leafy or lettuce like appearance uh, and this is a very common one the green shield to be looking out for I mean pretty much most of you could probably walk outside shine your flashlight on some trees right now outside where you live you'd probably see some common green shield around and similarly ubiquitous is the hooded tube lichen, which is a little more bluish gray in appearance, somewhat thinner, more sort of uh, tubular uh, uh, lobes on the, uh, the growth forms, which are, is called phalli or phallus, by the way, for lichen terminology, for those of you taking notes. And you, you'll often see both of these together on trees all over the place. So just two incredibly easy to find lichen species all around us. Uh, here's kind of a more sort of dramatic lichen species you'll find on often on on big boulders, you know, glacial erratic boulders in the woods, uh, the smooth rock tripe. With kids, I call it elephant ear lichen sometimes because it has these big sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, leafy lobes uh, for its growth form and uh, actually it changes color depending on the the moisture condition. So when it's dry, it's kind of brown and crispy. When it's uh, moist and warm, it'll, uh, you know, turn green and, and can very quickly go from the cryptobiotic state to the active metabolizing state. It's pretty remarkable to actually observe it with, you know, uh, hikes in the woods, I'll sometimes just pour a little bit of water on some of this rock tripe and you can see it change color and actually imagine the cells coming to life and becoming active again. And this is a good example of a, a species that's considered to be edible. Technically, all lichens are edible apparently if you boil them not exactly choice more like survival food if you really needed to to find something in the woods but um none of them are going to poison you so uh maybe something good to keep in mind if you're doing any arctic expeditions anytime soon here's an example of what we call a crustose lichen uh the whitewash lichen and these look just like splotches of paint really on the surface of a tree trunk or a rock hardly even noticeable but this is a living organism, or rather a composite organism. Uh, so this is a type of lichen often found on trunks of trees. So I just love to just remind people about lichens and just to be paying attention to really recognize just how common and ever-present 
uh, different kinds of lichens are all around us. Here's kind of a, a more, more notable and famous species, often called old man's beard. You go to old growth forests, you'll often see a lot more evidence of old man's beard, like uh, these long hanging growth forms, these long filaments. This is called a fruticose lichen, a different sort of growth form of lichens. Um, and this species is, is used as a medicinal species. It has different antibiotic properties, like some other things we've been talking about. And this is also a species that is used as an indication of air quality. So it's very sensitive to air pollution. If you have too much, you know, car exhaust or industrial pollution, you won't have the uh, the Usnea species, the old man's beard. So it's one that scientists can, you know, sort of uh, pay attention to and uh, look to for evidence of the quality of air in the environment. And you don't tend to find too much of these in more disturbed habitats. You usually have to go into more uh, untouched forests uh, for, to finding to find a lot of old man's beard. Here's one that I bet a lot of you've seen, uh, a really beautiful, very distinctive lichen called the British soldier lichen, another fruticose species. And you'll often find these, you know, on the ground or on dead wood or, you know, mixed in with the moss when you're, you know, on a mountaintop or something. And the fruiting bodies have these little stalks that are topped with these bright red cap looking things called the apothecia, which is where the spores are released. Lichens also release spores like other mushrooms. That's how they disperse. Uh, but just a really distinctive, fun, and easy to recognize species, the British soldier lichen, named after, you know, the, the, the uh, caps that British soldiers would wear, so a good evocative name there. So just wanted to give a little bit of a review of some lichen species to kind of finish out our review of winter fungi. And look at that, we didn't run out of time. So final photo here of my dog Griffin sniffing a few tinder uh, conks there. And uh, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I really hope this presentation tonight can be uh, a spark for you to get out and really explore and look for examples of these different mushroom species on your own, discover things that I didn't talk about. There's always new species out there. It's really just a wonderful world of diversity to be discovered, even in the winter months. So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing and open it up for whatever question time we have. Wow, John, thank you so much. That was great. There's so much, so many great comments coming in in the chat about what a great job you did and how informative it is and so good. So there are some questions um, and I'm just going to start with um, kind of going backwards. Are there any lookalikes for old man's beard? The lichen? Great question. Um, there are some other lichens that look kind of similar, one called the oak moss lichen that's a bit more kind of branchy, but again, no lichen is going to poison you. So it's not as big of a concern as mushrooms as far as if you want, if you want to harvest it for medicinal use. Um, a, little, a little bit of, of awareness of the kind of a hanging branching form is what you would need to really recognize it as the old man's beard. So uh, that's what I would say about that. The, okay, so um, I see a couple of hands, but I'm going to ask one more question question and then we'll take the hands that are up. Um, it's So here's one from Nick. Um, Nick is wondering, he's really interested and I'm sure lots of people are on the oyster mushroom, especially yeah. since it's a choice edible. Any tips on identification yeah, for the oyster you know, mushroom? Um, like I mentioned, oyster mushrooms, uh, they can be variable. They're called a species complex, which kind of illustrates like there's this, all this variation and kind of their, their appearance and genetic kind of uh, uh, diversity, uh, but really looking for the clustering growth, the fleshy texture, and, and the gills. The gills, like I mentioned, they kind of uh, grow from the side, the sort of lateral growth, and you have that, that decurrent appearance where, where they, they're not separated from the stalk. They kind of blend into it. But if you have that combination of criteria of the, the clustering, the fleshiness, and the way the gills are growing, that's a pretty good indication that you have oyster mushrooms. And they don't have any deadly lookalikes, which is why it's one I often recommend as a species to maybe start to hone in on if you're a beginner. But again, be super careful. If you're ever even a little bit doubtful, don't don't be that guy or, or woman that makes the mistake. <laughs> that was great, John. All right, let's get John R. He's had his hand up for a while. So John, Rochars, do you want to ask your question? Maybe not. Okay, we'll take the other, the Jonathan M. Would you like to ask your question? Um, do some lichen actually glow? What was that again? 
Do some lichen actually glow? Glow, bioluminescence. Um, yeah. As far as I know, there aren't any bioluminescent lichen. That's a pretty good question. Um, I never thought about that. As far as I know, the only bioluminescent fungi tend to be guild species. So we talked about the luminescent pinellus. Some of you may have heard of uh, jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, which are these orange, uh, uh, very large guild mushrooms that you can find in the fall or late summer. And uh, they are probably the most vibrant glowing species that I've ever encountered. But I, I don't know of any bioluminescent lichen. So good question. That's great, great question. Okay, um, here's a meta question from Kirsten. Kirsten, what decomposes the decomposers, John? Oh, all kinds of things. That's a great question. Mushrooms, they break down and they're, they're <laughs> decomposed like any other organic material. So other fungi often and, and bacteria as well. Certainly bacteria are a huge part of the decomposition process in nature. But I'm sure all of you have probably seen, you know, old, dead, gnarly mushrooms that are just breaking down. And uh, you'll sometimes see, you know, mold growing from old mushrooms. That's a fungus eating a fungus right there. Uh, there's lots of examples of, uh, you know, decomposer species eating another decomposer species once that that um, brooding body structure has has died and, and fulfilled its role and starts to break down. So it's all part of the, the cycling. Love it. Okay, here's from Tony, and I'm pretty sure this is Tony who um, had the picture in your slideshow. Oh, Tony's, cool. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> yeah, Tony's curious about, does the fungal part of lichen have mycelia? That, you know, that's a good question. So lichen is, is just such a unique and strange uh, uh, branching of fun fungi because of the symbiosis. And I don't really have um, mycelium in the same way that other species do. They have, you know, they, they do have little rhizomes, ways they can dig down into the structures of even, you know, uh, rock crystals and things like that to, to kind of get a purchase and even, even digest. Sometimes they do produce acids and they can break down some of the, the mineral structures they're growing on, but they don't really call it mycelium in the case uh, of lichen. So that, that's a good question. Um, but I would say in that case, it's not quite the same growth form. Cool. Okay, and here's one last question that came in, um, and maybe we'll take one last hand, but Owen asked this question pretty early, and, and it's really interesting and important. Um, he is wondering, are there any studies <sighs> done on the lack of snowpack due to climate change on mycelium activity? That is such a great question, and the answer is I don't know, but I want to know. I'm, I'm quite fascinated by like what climate change will do to uh, different different fungal uh, life cycles, and you know the fact that that fungus doesn't have to be beholden to the amount of light like plants do. It's it's really interesting to consider the um, maybe opportunistic. Uh, resilience or adaptation of different fungus species to, uh, you know, climate change and differences in snowpack, differences in, in temperature and moisture through the winter time, and I'm I'm sure there have been some, but probably not many. I, it's very speculative. I I don't have a good answer for that, but I, I would love to know, and it's quite fascinating to think about because, like I mentioned, some species probably do require maybe the snowpack, just like a lot of other organisms do, like rodents and things, to have that that buffering from the the cold during the winter. So I would not. I doubt that there's some types of mycelia that also require that that could be adversely impacted by less snow but it's a great question yeah hey owen maybe i'll look and see if there's somebody doing any research and maybe see if we can get them to come talk about it um at a zoom i noticed that kathy um shilmet you've got something you're showing us is that, that. a artist nice. conk very cool very cool do you want to tell us about that i i color on the front on um, the undersides of red bell well, excuse me red belted polypores so that's what this is oh it's a red belted polypore wow yeah, yeah. working on that i'm working on a scene from the old peg shop down um below where otterbrook dam is wow. this no longer exists but I'm working on a scene from a from a, a postcard, but wow. Anyways, cool. <laughs> so thank, thank you sharing. so much for sharing. Yeah. So I'm gonna just say this. Um, we're gonna wrap it up because we've already gone over. Um, John, maybe while we're wrapping it up, can you put your email in the chat? Yes. Um, so 